when he, he was doubting whether there was evidence for these Bible stories. The question was, have you any evidence for the Israelites in Egypt? And of course, Manfred said, no, we don't. We have found the evidence underneath the city of Ramesses in the lower city. And the reason why in the Bible it refers to the city of Ramses is because... Is there evidence for the Bible? A lot of people say no, but today I have the David Rolf, who was featured in the Patterns of Evidence video series to tell us otherwise. So David, I wanna welcome you to our show today. So excited that you're here joining us from Spain. Today's your birthday, right? Oh, well, yesterday, actually, yes. It probably still my birthday in America, but at the moment it's past my birthday. Okay. But nice to meet you, AJ. And then I, I think you're getting ready to have a, a big move. You're moving to the is it the back to the uk or yes indeed yes it's time to get back to what we call blighty old blighty which is uh <laughs> what we call the, the british isles basically back to the weather back to the rain back to the cold but it's it's necessary at my age and i'm assuming that's a move back for you right that's your that's your homeland right yeah exactly i was born in manchester so which is in the north of england not far from where the beatles were born so that's my neck of the woods as it were well, again, thanks so much for joining us today. Just wanted to welcome you to the program. Of course, I, I got to know you through the Patterns of Evidence video series with Tim Mahoney. Could you just start off by telling the audience a little bit about yourself? I know that you've written uh, written some books. Yeah, it's quite a few, to be honest. When I was a pretty young, at seven years old, I was writing Egyptian hieroglyphs. I haven't got a clue why, but I was. I was writing the names of all the different kings of Egypt wow. and the dynasties from Dynasty 1 to Dynasty 30. Uh, I have no reason to know why that was the case, but I was fascinated by the pharaohs in ancient Egypt. And uh, I grew up sort of studying the subject very, very much in detail. Uh, I went to Egypt for the first time at the age of nine. And in fact, I sailed with my mother from Cairo all the way down to Abu Simbel and King Farouk's paddle steamer because he'd been kicked out of the country and this beautiful paddle steamer was sitting on the banks of the Nile and we commandeered it and we sailed all the way up river 700 miles to Abu Simbel and that was my first introduction to into ancient Egypt as a, as a physical place. Um, I've been hundreds of times since then but um, I then fell into this terrible thing of being a, a musician and rock uh, musician and vocalist, <laughs> okay. and part of a band in the 1960s, late 1960s, and uh, that distracted me for quite a few years, about 30 odd years. I became a, a sound engineer and eventually a record producer as well. So wow. I have two feet. I have one in archaeology and history, and one in the pop and rock industry as well. So um, well, that's pretty cool. I'm a, bit of a mixed creature. Yeah, I was going to say you're a man of many character. hats. Well, quite exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. I think I prefer to be called Renaissance man. I think that's a nicer term. <laughs> <laughs> I love yes, it. I love it. I was just going to say that um, eventually I, I uh, made enough money out of record producing. I got a couple of platinum gold discs, gold and platinum disc albums, and I gave up music industry wow. and, and went went back to university, uh, studied Egyptology and ancient history and the archaeology of the Levant and and the Minoan archaeology of Crete and and the uh, and the the Greek world, the Bronze Age Greek world. And of course, that inevitably brought me to biblical archaeology because it's all part of that region. So I then got a fascination for that key subject, which was what was the relationship between ancient Egypt and the Bible? And that's really what led me to this whole new career of uh, not only presenting television series, which I did for Discovery Channel and Channel 4 in the UK called Ferris and Kings, and another one on In Search of Eden for looking for the location of the Garden of Eden. I did all that in the 1990s. And I wrote a series of books as well. And one or two of them were actually bestsellers in the UK and around the world. Not so much in America. I wasn't so well known in America until Tim came along and uh, knocked on my door or so to speak and gave an inter I did an interview for him and we've been friends ever since and that's how that whole thing started with the first of the of the films that Tim made on the Pattern Remnant series. Well I, I know that you made an impact on Tim and maybe you could kind of fill in the gaps here a little bit. Didn't he read one of your books and wasn't that what kind of uh, hit him at a crucial moment when he hit a wall and he was doubting whether there was evidence for these Bible stories? Am I right in that? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, he did go to Egypt. He met Manfred Bietak, who was the excavator at the city of Avaris, which we'll talk about later. And, and basically, Manfred turned around to him, and the question was, have you any evidence for the Israelites in Egypt? And of course, Manfred said, no, we don't. Uh, so then, he, as he say, he came back to his studios and he sat in front of his uh, editing suite, and he just didn't know where to go from there because he was this negative answer that he was not looking for. He was expecting something more positive. And, and as he says, and as he says in the film, he, he God said, spoke to him and said, go to your, 
your office and, and pull out a book off the bookshelf. And he did that. And it happened to be my book, Pharaohs and Kings, uh, which I published in 1995, along with the Pharaohs and Kings TV series. And he pulled it out and he started looking at it. And he saw all the answers to the reason why Madrid Bitak had said no to him. And that spurred him on to do something, you know, much more dramatic. At the time, he was working actually on... Uh, the location of the mountain of God and, and the story of the Ten Commandments, uh, looking at the idea of it being in Arabia. But this diverted him now to this whole business of when the story took place as opposed to where it took place. And that's really what Pharaohs and Kings, the book, was all about. When were the Israelites in Egypt? How long was the Sojourn period? Uh, who was the king of Joseph's time? And we moved on to who was the king of the Exodus and how the whole story unfolded because my specialism is actually Egyptian chronology. That's what, what I spent uh, most of my time at university studying and doing my PhD. And so uh, we discovered through that research that the Egyptian chronology had been miscalculated, it had been overstretched by about 300 years. And when you change it, when you reduce it in time, by 300 years, you find that it then synchronizes with the biblical text, the biblical story, and the archaeology that we find in Israel. And so it was a revelation to him that he had this new avenue that he could pursue now, which was different to the where was Moses mountain, mountain of God, to when it happened, and that was crucial. And I'm so glad he did that. I saw his movies in chronological order. Uh, the first one about really focused more on evidence for the Exodus. The second one, which to me as a seminary graduate was just as powerful, and that was on the the history of, of the writing, the ancient, what a lot of people are calling Paleo-Hebrew, suggesting that the Hebrews were the ones who developed our alphabet that we use. And I, I remember just how profound that was. Tell me a little bit more about that. Who do they say the Pharaoh of the Exodus is, and mm -hmm. why would you say that that's different? Well, the standard thinking in, in academia for the last sort of 150 years, 200 years, has been that Ramesses II was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And you see that in all the movies. You see it in the Cecil B. DeMille movies with Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner. Yul Brynner being Ramesses II and Shelton has to be Moses. That's fixed in our psyche now for the last, you know, since films were being made from the black and white era, we've always believed that Ramesses II was the Pharaoh of the Exodus. But that's something that Egyptology has decided upon, and actually it's quite wrong. Uh, the reality is that uh, the Pharaoh of the Exodus has nothing to do with Ramesses II. The Pharaoh of the Exodus was much, much earlier in time. But as I said, if you take out of the timeline of Egypt, you lower the dates of the earlier pharaohs, and then they synchronize with the biblical date uh, of the Exodus, which is around 450 BC, 446 to be exact. Uh, not the time of Ramesses II in the conventional dating scheme, which is around 1279 BC. So they're very different dates. And so what scholars have done is they've ignored the biblical text, telling us it was 480 years from the fourth year of King Solomon back to the Exodus. They totally ignore that. And they go for Ramesses II as the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Why do they do that? Well, because in the first chapter of the book of Exodus, it says that the Israelite slaves built a city, a store city called Ramses. Okay, and so that's the thing they latched upon. So they said, oh, therefore, Ramesses II must be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. The problem with that is that the 450 BC date or 446 BC date is much earlier than Ramesses II. So they contradicted the Bible. But what they didn't realize is, and what Manfred Bitak has discovered, is there's another city right underneath the city of Ramses, built by Ramesses II, in the same location, which does match the biblical date of much earlier on. And that's the one that was populated by thousands upon thousands of Hebrews, of Semitic peoples. The city of Ramesses II didn't have any Semitic peoples in it. We haven't found any evidence for them there. But we have found the evidence underneath the city of Ramesses in the lower city. And the reason why in the Bible it refers to the city of Ramses is because the time when the, the biblical text was being edited, probably in the time of King Josiah around that period, they knew the place as Ramses, and that's why it was renamed. But the real city of the Exodus is the one underneath, and that city is called Avaris which we mentioned earlier. That's incredible. I actually took my son on a, a trip over there to uh, to the Middle East. We were near Avaris when we were there, and I remember when I asked our tour guide about it, he said that it's just a grass field today. It is. Um, it's, and so can it's tell me the, a little bit more about this Avaris site. Yeah. What did they discover there? Oh, well, that's a very interesting question. The first thing is, where was the land of Goshen? Well, we know that from lots of evidence that it was in the eastern delta of Egypt. So that's northeastern Egypt on the border of, of the desert, the northern part of Sinai. So it's to the west of the Suez Canal today, if you want a modern reference to it. 
And in that region there, of course, it's delta. There's no stone there. There's no rocks and mountains. So it's fields, basically. And that's where the city of Avaris and the later city of Ramses was built on that location there. Now, the problem is that when archaeologists dig a field, which belongs to farmers or a series of fields, they hire them for a, a season or a year or two. And, and they dig down underneath and they found all the, the levels of the different levels of the city. But then at the end of the season, they have to backfill so the farmer can reuse the field again. So the archaeology is all actually in the reports they provide. There's nothing to see there at all now. If you walk there, you'll be in a field of cotton or something, you know, so you won't see a thing. It's all in the report, the archaeological reports, and that's what they say about archaeology. Archaeology is destructive. You destroy everything you dig down into to reach the lower levels. And therefore, if you don't record those levels properly, you lose everything. So the art of archaeology is always to record everything you find. So you ask the question about, well, where are the artifacts that were found? Well, the, the, the things like the, the Palace of Joseph that was discovered there, that's gone now. That's been excavated away and disappeared. You'll never see that in reality. The tomb of Joseph, which was a pyramid tomb, quite unique for this period uh, in, the, in the Middle Kingdom. Nobody, no private individual, only kings had pyramids in, this, in that particular period. So this was a man of, uh, who was greatly honoured by the state, by the pharaoh. That, that pyramid tomb has gone too. It's been excavated right down to its foundations. The, the burial chamber was found. That's no longer there. The, the chapel in front of the pyramid has gone as well. The only thing that's left to us is the statue that was sitting, a city, seated statue was sitting in the chapel in front of the pyramid tomb. And that now is in the basement of the Cairo Museum. And you'll probably never see that either because it's not on, on display anywhere, and I doubt very much whether it ever will be. So what you saw in the movie and what you see in my books, the photographs of that particular statue, are probably all you're ever going to see of those important relics. And the, the fascinating thing about that statue, and why we think it is a statue of Joseph, is the fact that not only did he have yellow skin, because we see it painted on the forehead of the statue, he had red hair, flame red hair, which we, again, we can see the paint on, on the statue's head, of his hair. And he was carrying a, what we call a throw stick, which is a symbol. It's like a boomerang. It's a symbol of hunting, which is also a symbol for an Asiatic or Semitic person. So we know that the person he was buried in that tomb was a Semite. Okay. What makes him Joseph is the fact that the coat he was wearing on this statue was a multicolored striped coat, a coat of many colors. And when they dug down into the, the funeral chamber underneath the pyramid, the burial chamber, it was empty. There was no coffin. There was no pottery. Well, and we know no... why it would be empty. Well, of course we do if you read your Bible, because Joseph on his deathbed asked his brethren that if they ever left Egypt, they would take his body, his mummified body, remember, with them, to the promised land and of course he was then reburied in Shechem where his tomb is today so the tomb would be empty so it yeah. fits Joseph perf perfectly although we don't have his name written on the circumstances the the, the high rank of this individual the multicolored coat the pale skin the throw stick indicating he was an Asiatic, a Western Asiatic or a Semite. The, the garden in which he was buried in this pyramid tomb had 11 other major tombs in it. Not pyramids, but major tombs. There were the smaller burials as well, but 11, uh, other, 11, 11 other major tombs. In this same palace garden where oh, wow. it was located, that makes 12 tombs. Okay, you then go to the <laughs> facade of the palace that was built for this individual, this Semite, and the facade has 12 columns across the front of it, a colonnade of 12 columns. So there's okay. number 12 is very significant here. And all the burial, all the other burials that they found in the garden, apart from the pyramid tomb, which was empty, had the bones of people with Semitic pottery, what we could call Hebrew pottery, weaponry of bronze, which again was typical of the period we're talking about. They were all Semites. They were not Egyptians, but buried in that cemetery. So it's that is, that's incredible. A, I, yeah. I mean, it's it's all it's it's striking, and it's it's almost like too good to be true. This is either some huge coincidence or it's Joseph. Well, yeah. Well, the huge coincidence is what all the academics say it is. 
I mean, that's the problem. You know why? Because it's too early to be the time of Joseph, and it's too early to be the time and of the... And that's it. That's the only reason for that's, dismissing that, that's The only reason for all this. It's the only way they... The proto sinaitic inscriptions in Sinai, which we now know are real Hebrew, written in Hebrew, can't be Hebrew because it's too early yeah. to be Hebrew. For the same reason, because they've got the Egyptian mythology wrong. Now, now tell me a little bit about your faith. I think if, if I understood correctly, I thought you had mentioned at, at one point in one of the shows, are you agnostic? Yeah, as long as we understand what that term means, okay. It yeah, doesn't mean explain that. It, it doesn't mean atheist. Some people think it means atheist. It doesn't mean that. What it means yeah. basically is that I'm on a stony road towards whatever I can understand as what faith is and what belief is. I'm not there. I'm not all the way there, okay. And I'm honest enough to admit that. You know, I find sometimes it a little bit disturbing when people profess their absolute faith but don't follow the teachings of Christ. I find that quite hard to accept. I, uh, I believe that Christ was a remarkable individual. His teachings were fantastic. They're wonderful teachings. And I, I try to follow them myself in every way that I can. But going on to the miraculous, that's more difficult for me to, as a scientist and as an archaeologist, to accept. And, and so I struggle with that. But I'm working there. And that's what an agnostic means. It means not knowing, not yeah, knowing yeah. for certain about something so i'm on a road that i'm i'm traveling and you know one day i'll probably get there but uh, it, it doesn't mean by any means that i reject god or jesus in any way shape or form i just find it um still op an open door for me well that makes sense and thank you for answering i i, I only ask because you do so much biblical archaeology and obviously there's an interest there for you and uh, i think when i heard you say that i it just it surprised me so uh you know, yeah, and, and it's actually in in many respects, it's actually a tremendous advantage to those who wish to promote the biblical text as historical. Because if you have somebody like me who's not a, an absolute believer, who's who's actually still got one foot in the other field, the field of the the Bible never happened, that telling you that the Bible really did happen, that we do have the archaeology yes, for it. Yeah, it right, the, absolutely. The Bible is the foundation of faith. Yeah. Without yeah. the Bible, there's no faith. Yeah. Well, there's no well, reality without the Bible. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I just want to encourage you. Jesus changed my life so many years ago and through reading the Bible and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Keep seeking, keep pursuing, you know, because exactly. he's you real. Know what, they and, say, uh, what people say, and, and you said it yourself just then, is Jesus has to come to you. Yeah. Okay. So I'm still waiting. That's basically my answer. Yeah, yeah. I believe he'll answer that prayer. Back to some of the stuff with the biblical archaeology. You sure. obviously have had a, des a a real desire to study some of this stuff. And, uh, you know, what what is it that drives you to, to the biblical side of things? Um, j just kind of fascination or, no, or some other reason? It's because I'm a truth seeker. You know, when I studied ancient Egypt and I found there was a problem with the timeline there, the first question I'd ask myself was, well, who was the neighbors of Egypt? Who was the nearest neighbor to Egypt? Well, it's Israel, for goodness sakes. Yeah, so there must have been a relationship between Egypt and Israel. How come we don't have any information about the relationship? Why is it so disconnected? Why is it that the Egyptian texts tell you this and the biblical texts tell you that, but they don't synchronize? And the obvious answer was because the Egyptian timeline was wrong. And if you get the Egyptian timeline right, the whole thing slots into place and locks into place. And that makes all the difference in the world. So once we realized that was the case, then we could look at the archaeology of Israel again and start seeing when these events took place in terms of the archaeology we see. Remember that the, the biblical archaeology that we see is not evidenced and not dated by text. There are no texts in Israel on the monuments. If you go to Megiddo or any of these big record sites, it doesn't have a wall saying Solomon built this. And the same thing happens in Jerusalem or any of the big cities there. We have to rely on Egyptian evidence to date those monuments because we find in the different layers or strata of the sites, we find Egyptian artifacts with Egyptian pharaohs' names on them. And so we date those levels to the Egyptian chronology. So if the Egyptian chronology is wrong, so is our interpretation of the archaeology of, 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 of the Holy Land. Yeah. So once you get the Egyptian dates right, you suddenly see them locking together with the real pharaoh of the Exodus, with the real pharaoh of Joseph's time, with the real pharaoh who gave his daughter as a, as a wife to Solomon. 
All it, those things now slop into place, which they never did before. Yeah, and, and so there's apparently, if I understand it correctly, there's gaps, right? That that they sort of fill in the gaps, and maybe they're filling in these gaps in Egyptian history and chronology wrong. Exactly. Is there a simple way to to explain that? Yeah, if if you can imagine that they they've worked out one or two things that they think are dated at a certain point in time. And then they come down to the next thing that they think they've dated in a certain point in time. And so they then spread out the data in between those two points as, as best they can. But of course, if you stretch the chronology, what they end up doing is spacing out all those different bits of evidence, stretching them out, making them longer than they really were. If you can compress them by changing one of those dates above to a lower date, then everything before it drops down in time and therefore synchronizes differently with the archaeology and, and Israel's history. So it's a complicated subject area. And it's very difficult to work on. There are very, very few chronologists in the ancient world who study this material, which is why so many people don't really understand what I do and what colleagues of mine do in the same field. And they think, oh, no, the Cecil B. Different Mill, you know, Exodus date must be right. It must be Ramesses the second. <laughs> and the same goes with the academics. Most of them don't know the chronology. So yeah. they just accept what people have told them in the past. And it's very hard to change their minds. Right. And I'm just thinking like, you know, back to I, I've always had an interest in history. My father got me into history when I was a kid. And so like I'm going back to history class in high school and that kind of stuff. And they throw yeah. dates out there, especially B.C. dates. And it, yeah. it's, it's making me like the discussion makes me go, well, it shows me that maybe some of these dates we really aren't 100 percent locked in on right on no we, we really don't know when when some of these things happened and where, where this affects what we're saying yeah. is we have this biblical discovery of this hard evidence of what could be joseph's tomb or it's just some yeah odd coincidence or the dating system could be wrong you know so it's one of those so so it's like it, it's just number one we don't really know uh some of the some of these historical dates that we've come up with especially when you go into yeah. deep time bc era correct yeah. and Sure. I mean, that's the problem, because you, you have to remember something. When Christ was born, we give that a date of 1 AD, don't we? There's no zero in chronology. We call yeah, it yeah. 1 AD. But we, 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 the scholars know that Christ was probably born between 3 and 6 BC. Yeah. Because Herod, Herod was long dead by 1 AD. I mean, you know, that was impossible. But we use that date of 1 AD for the birth of Christ. And BC simply means before Christ. OK, so people who lived in the previous centuries before the birth of Christ, the kings and, and all the rest of it, they didn't know Christ was going to get born. So they didn't say, Ramesses II, I was crowned in 1279 BC. That's what scholars have calculated to be his date. All right, because yeah. he could he just he said, this is year one of my reign. That's how they dated things. They didn't date them BC. We've invented BC. And, and so if we've miscalculated the adding up of all those reigns going back to the time of Ramesh II, and we've misinterpreted it, then his dates are floating. They're not real. They're just an, a, an imagination that we've worked out mistakenly. Well, so anything BC basically is a calculation made by archaeologists and chronologists. Let me ask you this question, because I think it ties into what we're talking about here. I, you know, there's a lot of people who question the validity of the biblical um, events and, and the stories and things like that, like the, the gospel yeah. saying that this stuff was, these stories were manipulated over time. But here you are, yeah. uh, a at least self-proclaimed agnostic, and you're saying uh, you, you don't have necessarily an ideological reason to embrace the biblical text. And no. you're, you're it, it seems like you're looking at not just the gospels, which are much more recent in, in, a, in time to us than the, uh, the Pentateuch and the, the Exodus and these stories. Yeah. It seems like you're, you're, you're taking these as historical records. Well, I treat them exactly like any other ancient document. Why should the Bible be different? I mean, I, I just don't get it. If you've got a a text of a Hittite emperor or a, a Ramesses II text inscribed on a wall of a temple and about a campaign or whatever, archaeologists accept that as for real, you know, and they, they analyze it and they see if it all makes sense. That's like, for example, Ramesses II in his fifth year had the famous Battle of Kadesh. Well, Egyptologists study that all the time and they work out whether or not it was boasting, whether or not the, 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 
The text on the walls is a true representation of what happened, blah, blah, blah. We have Hittite documents relating to that battle because they were the, the opposition, which also corroborate and disagree with what Ramesses says. So we can analyze that, and that's what we should do. Why do we yeah. treat the Bible differently? Why don't we look at the biblical text, compare it to the archaeology, find out if we have some evidence which matches what the biblical text tells us, and treat it like any other ancient document? And that's what I do. It's, it's a religious document. Yes, of course it is. But it's much more than that. It's a history of the people of Israel. Yeah. That's the secondary part of it, apart from the theological elements of it. So take out the miracles and look at what's left. You're left with a population of people who migrated into the Egyptian Delta in the time of Jacob and Joseph. They sojourned in the Egyptian Delta for a couple of centuries, perhaps more. They were enslaved halfway through that period. They then left Egypt under the, the guidance of Moses. They wandered in the desert for 40 years and they conquered the promised land, they destroyed Jericho, they destroyed Ai, they took over the country. Hundreds of years later they had kings like Saul, David and Solomon. Why can't we test that against the archaeological evidence? And, and make the starting point, and this is the crucial thing I think, make the starting point a, a place on this planet which we can, without any shadow of doubt, identify as a biblical location and look for its destruction. And that place is Jericho. We know exactly when Jericho was destroyed. It was destroyed and then it was abandoned for 600 years. So any time after that point, there was no Jericho. So when you look at the time of Ramesses II, what the archaeologists say is, well, there was no Jericho at that time. Therefore, he can't be the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And there could never have been a conquest of the Promised Land. So the whole thing falls to pieces. But if you look from when the, the Jericho was destroyed, you identify what that period was, then you could find the time when Joshua entered the Promised Land with the Israelites. And from that starting point, you can look backwards at Egypt to find out when the Semitic population turns up in the Eastern Delta, thrives, and then leaves. And it's all there in the archaeology. Once you identify the Jericho that was destroyed is the one that Joshua destroyed. Wow, and, and that makes a lot of sense to me, and I, I just wish other people saw that. It makes a lot more sense of, of history for us when we uh, can actually trust some of the historical records that we have and, and start to piece them together like that, especially from a position of faith. Uh, it, it certainly yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. But I it's think that's a good sadly, point. Sorry, I'm just going to say, unfortunately, academia doesn't think that way. Right. right. But uh, so I think this is a good segue into uh, another part of the conversation here. I know that you are more of a proponent of the Mount Sinai in the modern day Sinai Peninsula, the, that location. And, and it fits into the whole evidence of the Exodus thing. Uh, for me, okay. going on the that trip and seeing the different locations, visiting there, then going to Mount Sinai in Arabia and, and seeing that, experiencing that, it, it for me, that added a, uh, I don't want to say it added credibility to the Bible, like the Bible needs credibility, but it, it made everything seem more real, like I could actually envision a population of people in these places. But okay. I, I know that you don't, you don't take that view. You believe that uh, the Israelites, uh, that, that there's a lot of evidence for the Israelites, but you take that traditional Mount Sinai location there uh, at St. Catherine's Monastery. So I just wanted to give you a, a platform to talk a little bit about okay. that and maybe make your case for okay. why that is okay. the real Mount Sinai. Okay, I'm going to try to convert you, okay? So I'll ask you, I'll ask you, I'll ask you a few questions. Uh, I'm going to try to convert you to Christianity too, so just Okay, well, out. we'll see who wins this little argument, but okay. let's see how we go. Okay, um, how... Partner with Gospel Ministries to view the rest of this video and other content by subscribing at PastorAJ.com. Hey, there's one more thing I've got to share with you. I want you to know that you know Jesus and that you will one day be resurrected and spend an eternity with him. The Bible says that all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That all you need to do is confess Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So just say this prayer with me right now. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe that you died for my sins and that you were raised to life three days later. Make me born again in my heart through the power of your Holy Spirit and help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, you are saved.
Now go get yourself a Bible so that you can begin to develop godly habits in your life and make sure to join a Bible-believing local church where you can be baptized as an outward symbol of what God just did in your heart. If you don't have a copy of the Bible, send us a message and we'll get one to you. Welcome to the family, friend.